Edwinson, Jack's, excuse me, Jack's astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. Currently, they're on their way to the targeted splashdown site just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. My name is Kate Tice, Senior Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX, and joining me today from NASA Communications is Sandra Jones. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Kate. It is great to be here. Upon departing the International Space Station, Dragon underwent a sequence of departure burns. The crew also had a rest period and has since kicked off pre preparations for reentry, including getting in their launch and reentry spacesuits and successfully performing a leak check on those suits. This next phase of the mission is when things will really start to amp up, and Dragon has a series of steps to complete before returning Crew 7 home. First, Dragon will maneuver to the correct attitude and jettison its trunk, which is the cylindrical, unpressurized part of the spacecraft. The trunk is currently connected to the aft or the bottom section of the Dragon capsule, and that's where the heat shield is located. So, in order to expose that heat shield and get the vehicle ready for atmospheric reentry, we're going to jettison that trunk. And from there, the spacecraft will use its forward thrusters to perform a deorbit burn, which will put Dragon on a trajectory to return to Earth. This burn will last about 14 minutes once it starts. The deorbit burn uses Draco thrusters on Dragon, primarily the four located on the forward bulkhead, and is executed at the apogee, or the highest point of Dragon's current orbit around the Earth. This will alter Dragon's path to ultimately line it up to re-enter Earth's atmosphere and splash down off the coast of Florida. Splashdown is planned for 2.47 a.m. Pacific, 5.47 a.m. Eastern this morning, again off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. It's all going to go pretty quickly, but before we go any further, let's take a minute to meet our crew. First up is Lieutenant Colonel Jasmine Mogbelli, who hails from Baldwin, New York, and earned a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a master's degree in aerospace engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. She also graduated with honors from the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. As an AH-1W Super Cobra pilot and Marine Corps test pilot, she has flown more than 150 combat missions. In all, she accrued 2,000 hours of flight time in more than 25 aircraft. At the time of her selection as an astronaut, Mogbelli was testing H-1 helicopters and serving as the Quality Assurance and Avionics Officer for VMX-1. She is also the proud mom of twin girls. With this mission, she will have logged an estimated 199 days in space during her first space flight, including six hours and 42 minutes during a spacewalk. And today she is the commander of Crew 7. Sitting next to Jasmine is pilot Andreas Mogensen. This is Mogensen's second trip to the space station. His first was as the flight engineer for the ESA IRIS mission in 2015. He was born in Copenhagen, Denmark, and graduated with an international baccalaureate from the Copenhagen International School, a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from Imperial College, London, and a doctorate in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. In 2015, Mogensen became the first Danish person to go to space and currently is serving as the European Astronaut Liaison Officer to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. With this mission, he will have logged 209 days in space across two flights. And before we jump into this next one, you might hear some banging behind us. Uh, this is a working facility, as you may know, uh, open 24 hours a day working uh, to build rockets. So if you do hear that, that is some of what you might be hearing in the background. Um, so next up in the role of mission specialist is Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa. Furukawa's interest in space began when he was five years old and saw the Apollo 11 moon landing on TV. He was also a fan of the Japanese TV space hero Ultra 7. His professional career began as a medical doctor, but after seeing a news report about Japan auditioning for new astronauts to do science experiments on the space station, he decided to apply. He was selected by the National Space Development Agency of Japan to be an astronaut candidate in 1999. His first mission to the International Space Station was as a flight engineer for Expedition 28 and 29 that launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in June 2011. Following this mission, he will have logged 366 days in space across his two trips to space. And to round it all out, mission specialist Konstantin Borisov was selected to be a cosmonaut in 2018, and this was his first trip to space. 
He has a Bachelor of Economics from the Russian Academy of Economics, a Master of Science in Operations Research and Systems Analysis from Warwick University in Coventry, UK, and a Master in Aircraft Life Support Systems from the Moscow Aviation Institute. He's worked for companies such as Volvo and the Boston Consulting Group. He is also an experienced freediving instructor and an international freediving judge. He will end this mission logging 199 days in space. Now, to prepare for upcoming events, the Dragon spacecraft is currently doing a couple of things autonomously, meaning automatically. It's isolating the thermal control system fluid loops from the radiator. This system is what will help keep Dragon, uh, the, excuse me, the internal temperature of Dragon uh, comfortable for Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine during reentry. Dragon is also initiating separation of the claw mechanism, which will terminate all the data, the power, and the fluid connections between the capsule and the trunk. As I mentioned earlier, at the base of the vehicle is where that heat shield is located, and that's where the trunk is currently connected. So we're going to jettison that trunk in order to prepare the vehicle for re-entry, as that heat shield is a critical component of that re-entry, given the fact that it's going to be re-entering through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is going to be doing a ton of that work, creating lots of heat and friction and helping to slow the vehicle down using that heat shield. So we want to get the trunk out of the way and separate it from the capsule. We'll be sure to bring you live views of the vehicle whenever we have them. Unfortunately, due to ground station coverage, they don't, we don't, excuse me, we don't always have those beautiful views of the capsule uh, or of the crew inside the capsule, but as soon as we have them, we will be sure to bring them to you. On your screen now is a live view of SpaceX mission control here, actually just over to the side of us, uh, and that is where Dragon operators are stationed on console, monitoring uh, and observing the crew and the vehicle to to ensure that everything is going as planned. As I said, Dragon is doing several things autonomously, and these operators are monitoring those systems and those checkouts. So let's talk a little bit about the flight history of Dragon. So the development of Dragon for crew started with the Dragon cargo spacecraft. Dragon was decide, excuse me, designed from the beginning for flying humans to space, so much so that even the first Dragon, like the one just behind us, had a window. Before we could fly humans, uh, our teams implemented a number of design upgrades to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 were suitable for flying people, and then put both vehicles through thousands of tests to prove their safety. Dragon is capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond. It is the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth and is the first private spacecraft to take humans to the space station. Dragon is fully autonomous, which means that it can basically fly itself. But uh, it also has features, it also features full manual override capabilities just in case of an emergency. So taking a, a closer look at it, there you can see an animation. It stands at almost 27 feet tall from the bottom of the trunk to the top of the nose cone, and it's composed of two main elements. The capsule, which is designed to hold crew and pressurized cargo, which is the top half, and then the trunk, which is the unpressurized section there at the bottom half. The nose cone at the very top of the capsule protects the docking system and also the guidance navigation control system. The nose cone opens for docking and remains attached to Dragon, unlike the previous version of Dragon, uh, and that helps towards our reusability efforts. So right now, that nose cone is actually open um, as we have not yet closed it in preparation for the, um, for, excuse me, for capsule reentry. Dragon has a final burn to perform, which will be the uh, reentry burn, where it will utilize, as Sandra mentioned earlier, the four forward bulkhead uh, thrusters located at the top and we can't use those if the nose cone is closed. So it's still open and we'll close that after that burn is complete. Now, opposite of the nose cone is the trunk. It provides attachment points for Falcon 9, the Dragon capsule, and cargo. One half of the trunk is covered in, uh, excuse me, in, in, in solar arrays, and that helps to generate uh, power while Dragon is on station. Uh, the other half of the trunk contains a radiator that rejects heat from the active thermal control system to space using SpaceX's new PICA tiling technology. The trunk also now has new aerodynamic fins, which help provide stability in the event of an emergency abort. 
Now, in the event of an abort, Dragon is outfitted with eight Super Draco thrusters. Uh, and like the name implies, they are very similar to the nominal Draco thrusters that uh, Dragon uses for nominal operations, but the Super Dra Dracos are extra powerful and they will power, power the astronauts to safety. Dragon's Super Draco uh, launch escape system is a key safety feature of Dragon, which gives the crew the ability to quickly separate from Falcon 9 and safely escape from the time of launch all the way to orbit. Uh, and this is a feature that no other spacecraft in history has possessed. Dragon is also equipped with 16 Draco thrusters, as I mentioned earlier, used to orient the spacecraft during the mission, including apogee and perigee maneuvers, orbit adjustment, and attitude control. Each Draco thruster is capable of generating 90 pounds of force in the vacuum of space. Inside, the spacecraft is designed to accommodate up to seven crew members with modular seats that can be removed and replaced by additional cargo. The seats are made of carbon fiber and will be custom sized for any crew members flying on board. Uh, it is capable of flying up to seven individuals, but we only have four on board today. The control panel is centered between the pilot and the commander seats and consists of three touchscreen displays, allowing the crew to operate the vehicle and fly it manually. Once we get uh, that onboard view, of the Dragon capsule, uh, we'll be able to see that control panel uh, that, like I said, rests between the pilot and the commander seats. That's one of my favorite views that we get from crew missions because uh, it makes you feel like you're inside the capsule with them. You can even see some of the telemetry and the visualizations on the screens. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned the trunk as you were talking about uh, Dragon. We are just about seven minutes away from that trunk separation. Again, we do um, discard that trunk because it's no longer needed. It provides that power um, with the solar arrays to Dragon, but because they are about to deorbit and come home, that's no longer needed. So that will uh, be separated here in just a few minutes from now, and then it will um, harmlessly re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so while we await that, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the science that crew is seven participated in over the last 23 years crews aboard the international dragon spacex deorbit sequence start in five minutes for awareness this will occur during a tedious handover the next spacex call will confirm nominal trunk jettison Dragon Cappy started the orbit sequence in five minutes and we'll catch you after 10 seconds. And we did just hear those words from the core here in Hawthorne, California, up to Jasmine Mugbelly, the commander of Crew 7, uh, letting her know and the Crew 7 crew know that everything is looking good. They're proceeding towards uh, deorbit and uh, reentry here. Uh, targeting um, that re-entry at uh, 2.47 a.m. Pacific time this morning off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. And they did mention TDRS. That's that tracking and data relay system. Um, and as Kate was mentioning, we don't always have views of the crew on, on board Dragon or the International Space Station just based off of some of the uh, handover between satellites that occurs. Um, so this is expected, but we'll talk to the crew uh, once the trunk is successfully jettisoned. Um, so continuing on to talk a little bit about some of the science on board uh, Crew 7 that they helped to conduct. Over the last 23 years, crews aboard the International Space Station have completed thousands of scientific and educational experiments, and Crew 7 added to that growing number during their six-month mission to the space station. One of those particular studies is called CIFER, or the Complement of Integrated Protocols for Human Exploration Research. For longer journeys to the moon and Mars, scientists are examining how extended time and space affects the human body. Astronauts on missions of various lengths can participate in an integrated set of studies that monitors their health before, during, and after missions. Results could play a pivotal role in ensuring the safety, health, and success of astronauts on deep space exploration missions. Cypher began with Crew 7 and is continuing with Crew 8, which launched and arrived to the space, in, space station just last week. They also contributed to Sleep in Orbit, an investigation from ESA, or the European Space Agency. This study examines the physiological differences between sleep on Earth and in space. The stages of sleep are related to brain states and can be accessed based on the brain's electrical sig signals. 
Sleep in Orbit uses an earbud EEG device that measures the brain activity of astronauts during sleep. The device was de developed in uh, Denmark to easily wear without the helmet-like network of wires used for standard EEGs, making it less likely to interfere with sleep. Results could help guide development of measures to prevent or even mitigate poor sleep and its adverse effects, enhancing safety and improving work quality during missions. Additionally, controlling microbial growth in recycled wastewater is necessary to provide water that is safe for drinking and for personal hygiene and to protect the integrity of life support systems for human habitation in space. Bacterial adhesion and corrosion studied how spaceflight affects the formation of biofilms, which are communities of multiple species of bacteria that adhere to surfaces. This investigation looked at the ability of biofilms to corrode stainless steel surfaces, similar to those in space stations drinking water system, and examined how well disinfectants cleared out those biofilms. Results could provide insight into better ways to control and remove resistant biofilms and could contribute to the success of future long duration missions. So these are just a few of the more than 200 science experiments and technology demonstrations that took place during Crew-7's mission. Now let's talk a little bit about the suits that the Crew-7 crew is wearing. Um, they are iconic, they're gorgeous, and most importantly, they are safe. The suit's primary, primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. If that were to occur, the suit would inflate to provide a habitable environment long enough for the crew to return home. The flame-resistant materials on the outer layer also protect the crew in the event of a fire. Custom tailored, single piece suit. This means that the helmet, gloves, and boots all remain attached. The helmet is made from a 3D printed nylon and has a visor that pivots open. The quick disconnect or QD on the right thigh mates to an umbilical on the seat. This provides air for ventilation, uh, as well as a oxygen nitrox, excuse me, oxygen nitrogen or nitrox mixture for pressurization and allows for the electronics to be connected all from a single location on the suit. A tubing network inside the suit delivers air to the neck and limbs uh, to keep the crew cool while wearing the suit. The suit's communication system consists of uh, helmet-mounted microphones and in-ear speakers. All in all, it takes less than 15 minutes to put on the suit. Of course, uh, that is also with some practice as well. <laughs> Um, the suit, like I said, is um, uh, intended to be used inside of Dragon. It's an intravehicular activity, or IVA suit. Uh, when the astronauts move onto the International Space Station, the suits actually stay on board Dragon. They hang them up to dry, uh, and then once they're dry, they get packed away. Uh, the astronauts will then use NASA's extravehicular activity, or EVA suit, when performing activities outside of the International Space Station, such as, of course, spacewalks. So uh, a little bit of a difference there between the two suits. Uh, very important difference because uh, they are certainly made for two different intentions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just to jump in on uh, the EVA spaces that you were talking about for those external spacewalks, we did have one spacewalk that occurred during Crew-7's mission um, for uh, NASA. And Jasmine Milkbelly, the commander of Crew-7, conducted that spacewalk. Uh, it was her very first spacewalk, and it lasted six hours and 42 minutes. Wow, that is a long time for a first one, just to me, having never done one. <laughs> right, yeah, they usually are about, you know, six, seven hours or so. Uh, the, the limit on the time uh, for a spacewalk is what we call consumables. So uh, we often say that a spacesuit uh, is like a mini spaceship. It has all the oxygen that the crew needs to breathe. It purges nitrogen. Um, everything that they need to uh, live and work in the environment of the vacuum of space uh, is contained inside that spacesuit. So so uh, they can't do that forever. Obviously, yeah. there's a limit to how long those consumables last, but typically they are around that six, seven hour time frame. Very cool. So we just got word that claw separation is currently underway. Um, that is on time. Uh, we did hear a call out indicating that it was going to uh, begin at the 48 minute mark. And so it looks like that is tracking on time. Um, <clears throat> the claw is, the, is where the umbilicals for the power and the telemetry from the trunk and its solar arrays are connected to the capsule. Uh, once we are disconnected completely, the Dragon will be running exclusively on its battery power. Uh, after that claw 
claw is completely separated, we will jettison the trunk. Uh, and that is once again, uh, when we basically separate the trunk from the vehicle and that allows us to expose the heat shield, which will be critical for re-entry operations as the vehicle is coming back through the Earth's atmosphere. That's right, and it looks like we're now just about 20 seconds or so away from trunk separation. Um, so everything continuing to go really smoothly uh, this morning, and then right after that happens will be the deorbit slew uh, when the vehicle um, helps to orient itself to the proper position ahead of the deorbit burn. And we'll talk more about that as we get a little closer to deorbit burn now about um, less than five minutes away from uh, starting. So things That's really great. moving quickly this morning. Yeah, that Dior burn is important because that is when the crew commits to that exact location. Uh, if you've watched our uh, webcasts for Splashdown or crew return missions previously, you know that we're always tracking alternative. Uh, we just got word that trunk, trunk separation is complete. Tracking SpaceX, nominal trunk jettison. All right, good news there. Thought we might hear something back uh, from the crew, but as mentioned before, there is a TDRS handover, meaning uh, we're switching from one satellite to another of the um, tracking and data relay satellite system. So we might not hear anything back from the crew right now, but we got good news from uh, SpaceX core Arthur Burialt that uh, the trunk has separated. So the heat shield is exposed and that trunk will naturally uh, disintegrate as it also re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. And the trunk served its purpose by gathering energy from the sun through its solar cells and converting that to battery power. So since we separated the trunk, we can't generate any more new power, but we don't need to since we're coming home and Dragon has enough battery power power already stored on board. Yeah, Like we said, once we have views of uh, the crew inside the capsule, we hope to bring them to you uh, due to ground station coverage. Uh, we don't have live views through the entire uh, through the entire show, unfortunately, and we would love to see them just as much as you, so we hope to have those soon. But I can tell you that the crew is suited up and in their seats. They performed a leak check on those suits uh, prior to, uh, before we started the broadcast, uh, and everything looked good with those. And so um, they're basically in their seats, buckled in with the safety harness uh, and everything. Actually, look at that. Ask and you shall <laughs> receive. <laughs> there we have our first views of the morning inside Dragon Endurance with our Crew 7 crew. And as you mentioned, Kate, they are suited up for this phase of flight. They do wear those spacesuits during um, some of the more dynamic phases of flight, for example, during um, launch and as they reach orbit, as well as docking, undocking, and, and deorbit and splashdown. And so we are seeing a view here um, in the center of your screen. That's Commander uh, Jasmine Mogbelli of NASA. Uh, this is her first space flight. And we are just about two minutes and 20 seconds away from that deorbit burn uh, beginning. Yeah, we did see that the crew did have their visors in the open position that is allowed for now. Uh, we will hear from SpaceX core instruction to the crew to close their visors and put them in the lock position. Uh, I can't quite remember off the top of my head if that comes prior to deorbit burn or prior to uh, the reentry phase, but we'll find out soon enough. And that do orbit burn again will place Dragon on a precise trajectory to return to the splashdown zone, which is targeted for off the coast of Pensacol Pensacola, Florida, rather. Um, and the do orbit burn is quite a long burn. It lasts about 14 minutes once it begins. So at this point, we're now about a minute and 30 seconds away from that do orbit burn beginning. Again, we're getting another view inside of Dragon here. On your left is uh, Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. And then to his uh, right is ESA, or European Space Agency astronaut Andy Mogensen, NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut uh, Satoshi Furukawa on the far right. And so now we're getting another view of uh, Konstantin Borisov here. And, and like we've said a couple times, they are suited up for this phase of the flight and will remain in their spacesuits all the way through uh, the deorbit burn, through splashdown, and as they um, get onto the recovery vessel, as well as, um, as they uh, are egressed or exit Dragon. Now, when the crew 
egresses from the capsule, we will utilize the side hatch, which is actually in view right here. Uh, it was that um, <clears throat> the rectangle that had the black outline just at the feet of the crew. That is the side hatch. That has been closed since when they ingressed to the capsule on launch day. So uh, basically when they're up at the International Space Station, they utilize the forward hatch, which is the hatch at the top of the capsule, um, because that's where the International Docking Adapter is located, and that's what docks to the space station and allows them to ingress and egress um, onto the station and into the capsule during their uh, during their stay. So, and we just got a call out saying that uh, deorbit burn has begun. Uh, this burn is expected to uh, last for about 14 minutes. Yep, and just a quick recap here. Within the last 10 minutes, Dragon has jettisoned its trunk and initiated that deorbit burn just seconds ago, um, 20 seconds ago, and it is uh, a little less than 14 minutes uh, in, in all. Uh, so for these operations, NASA and SpaceX do closely coordinate with the United States Coast Guard to establish a safety zone to ensure public safety and for the safety of all those involved in the recovery operations, as well as the crew on board the returning spacecraft. Multiple notices regarding splashdown are issued to the Mariners in advance and during recovery operations, and Coast Guard patrol boats are deployed to discourage boaters from entering the splashdown zones. So we do really want to stress to the public the need to respect this safety zone. Recovering a spacecraft from the water is a hazardous operation, and any other boats interfering increases the risk to the astronauts in the capsule, the teams working to recover them from the water, and the safety of those that come too close. So for the safety of the crew and your safety, we do recommend you sit back and watch, and we'll continue to bring you the best possible views of our astronauts' homecoming. Like I mentioned earlier, this deorbit burn is the last time that those four forward Draco thrusters will fire. Dragon Endurance has not yet entered the Earth's atmosphere. This deorbit burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing site. Like we mentioned earlier, we're targeting just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida today. Right now, Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine are using their screens to keep tabs on the burn duration, the Draco thruster firings, and trajectory details like entry angle, uh, capsule perigee, and how much distance remaining until the deorbit burn completes. Dragon is flying itself, so all the crew really has to do is stay strapped in their seats and keep tabs on things, which sounds easy, but I've said it before, I'll say it again, if I were in there, I would be wanting to take off my strap and look out the window because <laughs> uh, what a view it would be. Now with Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine about ready to deorbit and splash back down on planet Earth, they'll be heading to one of seven targeted sites supported by SpaceX and NASA. All of these sites are located off the coast of Florida, either in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. Spreading the supported sites across multiple locations helps to maximize the return opportunities for this mission and future crews, lowering the chance that we'll have to wave off due to bad weather. And again, NASA and SpaceX jointly selected primary splashdown location for Crew 7 off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. This selection process works with a lot of different variables, including the space station's orbital trajectory, what landing sites are available and have favorable weather, how much free flight capability Dragon has for the trip home, and the sleep schedule for the returning crew members. And so all of those boxes were checked. Pensacola was uh, considered prime, and we are hearing that the weather there is just perfect. The wave height is very minimal. Um, so looking forward uh, to see the crew splash down uh, here in less than an hour. Absolutely. Now, in general, for return, we start calculating daily return options based off of the space station's current orbit and Dragon's capabilities to maneuver and line up for re-entry. The time from undock to landing at the primary site can vary from less than six hours to more than 39. Getting home the quickest comes with some obvious benefits, but uh, we always have to make sure that the crew is properly rested for dynamic operations, which prevents us from scheduling 20 plus hour days for them, thankfully. Trajectory and ballistics experts provide the daily opportunities that would line up with Dragon, uh, excuse me, would line up Dragon with the seven landing zones and split them into what we call ascending and descending opportunities. 
Dragon uses its Draco thrusters after leaving station to execute a series of altitude lowering maneuvers and to line up with the selected primary site. It can also change to different alternate sites while in free flight if sudden weather moves in so that we need to avoid it. And weather is something, again, we're constantly looking at, making the final call to proceed about two and a half hours before the crew undocks. Everything looking good though, we are still continuing to uh, target Pensacola. For the Crew 7 return, we looked at a number of weather items. Some of the obvious ones are no rain or chance of lightning in the recovery zone, both for the safety of the crew inside the capsule and the recovery teams on the water. We're also looking for wind speeds less than 15 feet per second or about 10 miles per hour and relatively calm seas so we can safely execute recovery operations, which includes landing a helicopter on the recovery ship to fly Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine back to Florida. Once Dragon began flying free today, we had a number of additional checkpoints to proceed towards the primary site, head to the alternative, or select a new zone based on real-time weather data. These checks happened all the way up until we're in the final hours before the deorbit burn, which is the last burn in the trip home and commits the Dragon capsule to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And again, that deorbit burn is currently underway. We're five minutes and 35 seconds into it uh, with just about eight minutes remaining. Now we are waiting to hear the call out for nominal burn to confirm completion of the deorbit burn for Dragon Endurance. As we mentioned earlier, we when we have views of the capsule, we will bring them to you, but due to ground station coverage, unfortunately we don't have them for the entire show. Uh, but the crew is in their seats, they have their suits on, uh, and they are continuing to monitor Dragon uh, as on its way back to planet Earth. It's like we mentioned before, it's heading to Pensacola, Florida, located in the Gulf of Mexico. On your screen now is a live view of Mission Control Hawthorne, uh, where Dragon operators are standing by, uh, monitoring Dragon's progress uh, and reviewing activity um, and informing the crew of any changes uh, necessary. And so while we await that deorbit burn to uh, wrap up, we will talk a little bit more about an upcoming cargo flight to the International Space Station. Later this month, SpaceX's 30th Commercial Resupply Services mission to the International Space Station for NASA is slated to lift off from the agency's Kennedy Space Center. SpaceX's Dragon uh, will deliver new science investigations, food, supplies, and equipment to the international crew. NASA and partner research flying aboard the C SpaceX 30 mission includes a look at a plant metabolism in space and a set of new sensors for free-flying Astrobe robots to provide 3D mapping capabilities. Other studies include a fluid physics study that could benefit solar cell technology and a university project from CSA or the Canadian Space Agency that will monitor sea ice and ocean conditions. Commercial resupply by U.S. companies significantly increases NASA's capability to conduct more investigations aboard the orbiting laboratory. And these investigations lead to new technologies, metal, medical treatments, and products that improve life on Earth. Other U.S. government agencies, pr private industry, and academic and research institutions can also conduct microgravity research through the agency's partnership with the International Space Station National Laboratory. All right, let's talk a bit more uh, with the uh, about ongoing um, astronaut graduation. NASA welcomed its newest class of uh, the next generation Artemis astronauts in a ceremony at the agency's Johnson Space Center in Houston just last week on March 5th. Selected for training in 2021, the astronaut graduates were chosen from a pool of more than 12,000 applicants. Wow, just incredible. And successfully completed more than, uh, more than two years of required basic training, including spacewalking, robotics, space station systems, and more. The graduating NASA astronauts, I will let you handle all the names <laughs> as I'm sure you've practiced them many times. <laughs> okay. So the graduating NASA astronauts are Nicole Ayers of Colorado Springs, Colorado, Marcus Berrios of 
Guanabala, Puerto Rico, Chris Birch of Gilbert, Arizona, Denise Bunham of Wasilla, Alaska, Luke Delaney of DeBerry, Florida, Andre Douglas of Chesapeake, Florida, Jack Hathaway of South Windsor, Connecticut, Anil Menon of Minneapolis, Chris Williams of Potomac, Maryland, and Jessica Whitner of Clovis, California. So continuing the long tradition of international partnership to UAE or United Arab Emirates astronauts, Nora al Matrusi and Mohammed al Mula of the Mohammed bin Rashad Space Center trained alongside their NASA counterparts for the past two years, as well as participated in the graduation ceremony. The graduates are now eligible for flight and may be assigned to missions designated for the International Space Station, future commercial space stations, and Artemis missions to the moon in preparation for Mars. And NASA has also recently announced the opening for the next round of astronaut applications. So if you are interested, you can apply if you meet the qualifications. To be considered for an astronaut position, applicants must be a U.S. citizen, have a master's degree in a STEM or science, technology, engineering, or math field, and have a minimum of three years of related professional experience and be able to experience uh, be able to uh, have that successful experience to complete the long duration flight astronaut physical. The master's degree requirement can also be met by two years of work toward a doctoral program, a completed medical degree, or even completion of a nationally recognized test pilot school program. Astronaut candidates must also have skills in leadership, teamwork, and communications. Artemis generation astronauts will explore and conduct experiments where humans have never been the lunar south pole. With NASA's plans for the future of exploration, new astronauts will fly further into space than ever before on lunar missions and may be the first humans to fly onto Mars. Astronaut applications are currently open now through April 2nd, so for more information, visit nasa.gov astronauts if you're interested in applying. I always love looking at the resumes of uh, astronaut selection because it's just such a, a diverse group of people that have such incredible uh, experiences from all parts of the world and uh, and beyond. Uh, there are people that um, you, you just look at each cadre and it's just an incredible group of people. Uh, special shout out to Anil, uh, former SpaceXer, uh, and we're so happy to see him among the group. Yeah, absolutely. It is always exciting to welcome in a new class and, of course, do the recruitment. I'm really looking forward uh, to seeing who is selected for this next round. Uh, so, again, if you're just joining us, uh, we are awaiting the return of Crew 7 after their six-month mission to the International Space Station where they conducted science, research, and investigations, as well as participated in technology demonstrations. We are currently awaiting the deorbit burn to end. Uh, that is a, a longer burn, but it now has about a minute and 30 seconds remaining in that do orbit burn and that's really going to help us get in the prime position to start to dip into the earth's atmosphere ahead of splashdown yeah that do orbit burn as we mentioned earlier is what really commits the crew into their final landing site um, as <coughs> excuse me as we mentioned before we always have a primary and a backup location and so if for some reason the weather would have uh, turned unfavorable or the landing area wasn't clear, we would have been able to pivot to a different landing zone. Uh, but this deorbit burn is what really commits the crew into that final selection. So we are targeting the, the primary uh, splashdown site just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, um, on the in the Gulf Coast, uh, off, excuse me, off the Gulf Coast of Florida. Uh, and and we're looking forward to having them back. The crew is uh, in their suits. They are in their seats. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, they've been up there for about six months. And I'm sure they're really excited to come home. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So standing by uh, for confirmation that that deorbit burn has ended. We expect that in about 30 uh, seconds or so. We were talking a bit about the TDRS or tracking data relay system uh, handover, uh, basically just a brief time period where we may not have communications with the crew due to those satellite handovers. Uh, but we do expect uh, to hear confirmation that that burn was nominal. Dragon SpaceX, deorbit burn complete, performance nominal, nose cone closure initiated. And right on time, great to, right, hear, <laughs> great to hear that that deorbit burn was successful. 
our forward bulkhead Draco thrusters in order to perform that deorbit burn. So now that that deorbit burn is complete, and as we heard, it performed normal, or excuse me, <laughs> nominal, which basically means normal, uh, which is good news. And in the background, Dragon is going to work to currently inhibit those forward bulkhead Draco thrusters that we just used to complete the deorbit burn, ensuring it's safe to latch the nose cone shut for re-entry. And that nose cone will remain shut all the way through splashdown after this point. Also, the vehicle has an, uh, initiated the Nitrox suit purge. This helps to keep Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine cool and comfortable during re-entry. Uh, that re-entry is coming up in about 20 minutes or so. At this point, uh, again, the nose cone is, is closing to help protect the forward hatch um, for re-entry. And the crew on board, uh, Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine will use their screens to monitor the locking of the nose cone, which is done by a set of hooks. So just a couple minutes out from that nose cone um, fully uh, closing. It looks like we have about a minute and a half uh, for that nose cone to close. Uh, as you mentioned it's uh, earlier, it's not just a simple shut. There are uh, a couple sets of hooks that have to lock in. So we're expecting that to wrap up in about a minute and a half. Um, shortly thereafter, we'll hear a call out. Uh, we'll probably hear a, um, <clears throat> a debriefing from SpaceX core to the crew uh, to give them the latest update on uh, final splashdown time, as well as the anticipated uh, loss of uh, signal or LOS. This happens every, uh, every crew return mission where the plasma on the outside of the capsule builds up so much so that communications and commanding of the vehicle are, are not allowed. Um, and so it basically means that we won't be able to call the crew and the crew won't be able to call down to us. Uh, that typically lasts between five to seven minutes or so. Uh, so we should get a pre-re-entry br uh, brief from the core um, and hopefully we'll get the, the, the final update on expected weather. We did hear earlier uh, that the anticipated wind speed was 4.2 knots and that the wave height was less than one foot. So um, all in all, it should be, uh, fingers crossed, a pretty um, pretty stable recovery in terms of the crew won't be bobbing up and down too much with high waves. Yeah, I couldn't ask for any better weather. Um, so again, we're standing by for that nose cone to successfully close. That has remained open uh, since the crew launched all the way back in August. Uh, the nose cone is opened shortly after launch. And the reason it needs to open is because that nose cone actually exposes all of the uh, docking mechanisms, the umbilicals, uh, and how the Dragon attaches to the International Space Station. And then it ultimately um, becomes the hatch that the crew utilizes to float on board the International Space Station. So that has been open for the past six months, and right now we're working on that nose cone uh, to be closed. We do expect that call out uh, just moments from now that the nose cone was successfully closed. We're going to stand by. Um, oh, actually, we are now hearing that the nose cone has closed. Uh, so we will ho hopefully hear something from the core to confirm that. But we are seeing here uh, that the nose cone has closed. Now, as we begin the second half of entry, Dragon is now beginning to inject cooled excuse me, cooled nitrox uh, or nitrogen-oxygen mix mixture uh, into the suits uh, that are worn by Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine. Um, they receive this air. Um, it's also important because they will be told to, uh, to close the visors on their helmets, uh, which means that they need air. So we're going to flow some of that nitrox air, which is the same air that you breathe when you go scuba diving. Um, so it's cooled. It helps keep them comfortable and also provides breathing air uh, during the uh, re-entry phase. Uh, now, the heat shield, we talked about that before, um, and it's a critical component of the capsule because uh, the external temperatures will reach uh, about 3,500 degrees. Uh, which means that uh, the heat shield will protect the capsule as well as the rest of the thermal protection system uh, during that re-entry phase. But that heat shield uh, will basically be pointing forward. Uh, it will 
um, be receiving the atmosphere. And this is a good thing. Uh, we, the atmosphere will actually be helping us out quite a bit this evening, or this morning, I guess it is, um, as the capsule in its orbital velocity, which is going right now, is going 17,500 miles per hour. And that uh, the atmosphere will actually help to reduce that speed down to about 350 miles per hour, which is when the drogue parachutes will deploy. So the atmosphere actually does us a huge favor uh, by uh, providing that friction that helps to slow the capsule down. It does generate a great amount of heat though, and that's what that heat shield and the thermal protection system, uh, which are the white panels uh, all around the, the exterior of the Dragon capsule, although they're not so white after they re-enter. Uh, looks a little bit like a, a toasted marshmallow. <laughs> Um, but uh, we will uh, get to see that uh, live here. Uh, we are coming up to um, landing in just about 20 minutes or so. Uh, so we'll be able to see that for ourselves. It's one of my favorite things uh, when we get to see uh, the capsule being lifted out of the water uh, and onto the recovery vessel. Now, if you've just recently joined us, we are targeting a splashdown off the Gulf Coast of Florida near Pensacola. Uh, recovery vessel Megan is en route, or excuse me, is already there in position waiting for uh, Dragon Endurance to splash down. And we are expecting that splashdown to occur in uh, about 20 minutes or so. Yeah, we're targeting splashdown at uh, 2.47 a.m. Pacific time. Um, so the next major milestone that we are looking ahead towards this morning is EI, or entry interface. And that is when the crew begins to re-enter uh, the Earth's atmosphere and do that slowing down portion, which is critical um, to help bring their speed down ahead of splashdown. And uh, during that time period, we will experience what is known as a blackout period, where we will not have communications or visuals with the crew due to that plasma building up around the heat shield this is expected um, and we will regain communications with uh, the crew when they are there on the other side of that uh, blackout so to talk a little bit more about the heat shield SpaceX partnered with NASA to develop Pika X which was the second generation product used on all Dragon 1 uh, cargo resupply service missions that successfully resupplied the space station on 20 missions Pika 3.0 was developed specifically for use on Dragon 2 crew and cargo. It has enhanced structural and thermal properties that optimize the heat shield and help drive down the cost and mass as well. The remainder of the Dragon capsule is composed primarily of a SpaceX proprietary ablative material. It's another class of thermal protection which is lighter weight versus Pika. SpaceX, no code secured for entry. Dragon Cappy is your principal. All right, just uh, back and forth there uh, with SpaceX core uh, Arthur Berrialt. Um, as I was saying before, um, the SpaceX proprietary ablative material uh, is another class of thermal protection and is lighter weight versus PICA, and it helps protect the underlying composite structure during reentry in order to ensure that these structural capabilities are maintained, which is super important because we reuse these capsules. And while Dragon will experience temperatures well over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit during peak re-entry conditions, the characteristics of the TPS thermal protection system coupled with the EECLIS environmental control and life support system is the pressurized interior that will ensure that Jasmine Mogbelli, Andy Mogensen, Satoshi Furukawa, and Konstantin Borisov stay cool and comfortable during all phases of re-entry through splashdown. After Dragon Endurance has re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, a series of parachutes will deploy to slow the crew's descent. First will be the two drogue chutes, followed by the four main chutes to guide Dragon to its first contact with Earth since launching in August of last year. Dragon will automatically deploy these parachutes when different pressure and positioning sensors on the capsule detect that they're at the right speed and altitude. The vehicle's velocity at drogue deploy is approximately 350 miles per hour, and those drogue uh, parachutes do deploy at about 18,000 feet. Vehicle velocity when the main deploy uh, is initiated is approximately 119 miles per hour, and those deploy at about 6,500 feet. And then vehicle velocity when they do splash down is about 16 miles per hour. 
And that, of course, is, of course, is at zero feet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, it, the, those stroke parachutes, um, we mentioned before that the atmosphere does quite a bit of work uh, in order to uh, slow the vehicle down as it is reentering the atmosphere. The drogue parachutes also do a tremendous amount of work. I want to give a special shout out to our Bloomfield, Connecticut site that manufactures our drogue parachutes, uh, SpaceX parachutes. Uh, and uh, I've seen the drogues in person and it is incredible incredible how small they are they uh, let me rephrase that they look small on 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 camera but they're actually much bigger than i thought they were and it's just incredible how mighty they are even though they're not nearly as big as the main parachutes are like sandra mentioned they basically bring the capsule down from 350 miles per hour to about 119 miles per hour. Uh, so those drogue parachutes uh, are important, not just for stabilizing the capsule, but also helping to decelerate it even further. Now, after Dragon Endurance uh, has re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, um, we, I, we were just talking about those, dro those parachutes, uh, uh, those drogue parachutes, that will, um, those will be followed by the four main parachutes to guide Dragon to its first contact with Earth since launching in August of last year. Uh, Dragon will automatically deploy these parachutes when different pressure and positioning sensors on the capsule uh, detect that they are at the right speed and altitude. So um, we have a lot coming up in basically the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, we're targeting um, splashdown about 25 minutes from now. Uh, that entry interface beginning in, in 10 minutes, uh, about 11, I would say, actually, and then blackout about 12 minutes and 50 seconds from now. So it's going to um, start to really ramp up. Uh, but again, everything is moving along smoothly. We did have the trunk that separated successfully. The nose cone has been um, closed. We had the deorbit burn that was successful as well. Um, so now we're just waiting for uh, dry to dip down a little further into the atmosphere, that orbit to be lowered uh, so that they can begin that entry interface portion of today's flight. Exactly, and that is expected. Uh, the crew knows, <laughs> excuse me, the point of time in which uh, that will occur. And um, typically we, we, start to, uh, we start to hear the crew uh, hail back at us, um, um, typically a little bit earlier than, than the predicted um, loss of signal uh, period is. So. All of this coming up in the very near term, as we mentioned earlier, things go kind of quickly. Uh, it seems like just, you know, they were just undocking moments ago, and here they are already on their way back to planet Earth. Once again, we are anticipating a splash town time of um, 2.48 a.m. Pacific time here, or 5.48 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, the wind speed uh, is about four knots, so pretty, pretty mild, and the wave height is less than one foot, so all in all, really good. Uh, as for night recovery versus day recovery, uh, this capsule in particular, Dragon Endurance, has only done night recoveries. So we've actually done nighttime splashdowns for Crew 1, Crew 2, Crew 3, Crew 5, and Crew 6, and soon Crew 7. Uh, and Dragon Endurance supported Crew 3, Crew 5, and of Dragon course Crew 7. for entry briefing. Dragon for sea pressure briefing. I uh, want to remind you we have an expected LOS at 0934 Zulu, expected AOS at 0941 Zulu. All other times are going to be accurate per the tablet timeline. No other updates at this time for entry. Weather remains nominal and recovery forces remain ready to support. Dragon Tapti is expected LS from 0934 to 0941. And Tapti on the weather and recovery forces. Good read back, Josh. And so those communications uh, from the ground here in Hawthorne, California, up to uh, Crew 7 Commander, NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, um, letting her know about uh, some of the expected events that are ahead. Uh, so first up will be the entry interface in about eight minutes from now, uh, and then that blackout period about nine minutes and 45 seconds um, from now. 
we will have a loss of signal period during that um, time period and then we will have splashdown we are targeting that splashdown again for 2 47 a.m pacific time and that is 22 minutes and 30 seconds from now um, everything continuing to move along smoothly the weather off the coast of pensacola florida is ideal and perfect for splashdown um, the crew is feeling good they're suited up uh, they've completed that dew orbit burn the trunk has already been separated the nose cone has been closed uh, so we're continuing to check through those milestones and again looking uh, forward to that entry interface in the seven minutes from now And it looks like we are getting uh, some views inside the capsule right now. Uh, that is NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, who is uh, the commander. She's um, the, the prime one you see in your screen there in this over the shoulder view as well, uh, showing European Space Agency astronaut Andy Mogensen. Um, as Kate mentioned, we can see on their screens, they're monitoring everything, um, just keeping track of where things are at as they approach splashdown in 21 minutes and 30 seconds from now. Um, but on their end, they don't have to do much. They um, are able to just sit back and enjoy the ride as it uh, is Dragon is an autonomous vehicle. Yeah, that view right there, we can actually see right in the center uh, that, well, it was <laughs> showing us the uh, splashdown zone. Uh, once again, we are targeting off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. And uh, that display, I believe they're able to track Dragon uh, live as well. So that was a static view of where they are targeting, but I believe they can also track Dragon as well, which would be really fun if you're sitting there and you happen to be, you know, re-entering over your hometown, uh, you know, wave below to, to friends and family. Uh, I think that'd be a pretty cool experience. And speaking of that, Dragon will actually be re-entering right over my hometown in the <laughs> middle of nowhere, a tiny town in Nebraska. But if you are in the Midwestern portion of the United States, um, if you go outside right now, you uh, will have just a few minutes uh, from now, you might be able to see Dragon as it flies overhead, uh, beginning to fly across uh, Southwest Nebraska through Kansas, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, um, and of course, splashdown off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. So if you are anywhere along that trajectory, um, you can look outside and see Dragon fly over ahead. Again, that entry interface, um, when we expect uh, Dragon to maybe first begin to be visible, uh, will be at about 5.36 a.m. Eastern. So head out outside now and you can maybe listen to the broadcast on your phone and we'll keep you updated. Um, and hopefully we'll see some photos from you all of, of seeing Crew 7 re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. I personally haven't seen a dragon uh, re-entry yet, but I have been told by friends and colleagues that have seen one that it's it's pretty spectacular uh, and that it's it's remarkably bright, which I mean makes sense. It is from going from 17,000 miles per hour down to about 350. So yeah, there will be a bright streak across the sky uh, and it will look if you've seen a rocket launch, it will look different than that. So um, like, uh, like you said, if you're, if you're in that area, head on out and yeah, you might be able to see it. Um, it's a, a, a different meaning for a flyover state. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. And especially with uh, uh, evening splashdown, the views uh, should be pretty spectacular here. So um, it looks like we are now about four minutes away from entry interface and about six minutes away from that blackout period beginning. Yeah, you make a great point about views uh, during nighttime splashdown slash recovery operations. It's easy to assume that a, a nighttime operation um, is not as visible, but we have uh, multiple vessels out there, primarily the recovery vessel Megan with uh, you know bright floodlights. So we can see there the crew is now uh, putting their visors down in preparation for entry interface and, um, and ultimately splashdown. This is also one of the final moments that we can see uh, zero G. Dragon tablets are secure, the strengths are tightened, and visors are down all four crew. SpaceX copies all for crew entry preparation. We are five minutes to expected blackout. We'll see you on the other side at 0941. Okay, copy SpaceX, we'll see you on the other side.
And okay, so, that, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I was just gonna say that was SpaceX core Arthur Berrialt, uh, letting the crew know that they're about five minutes out from that entry interface and that we expect to, uh, or we expect to get their signal back, also known as acquisition of signal or AOS at 0941 UTC, uh, which will be 241 Pacific. So uh, we should expect to hear Jasmine's voice once again, um, in about uh, 40, or excuse me, in 11 minutes from now. Math is really hard at this time of night, <laughs> morning, whatever it is. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, and we were just getting a view there of some of the stickers on board Dragon. Those indicate the other missions and the other crew that have flown aboard uh, Dragon. So it's interesting to see uh, more and more stickers fill up these Dragons as we fly more frequently. Again, we're about two minutes away from the entry interface beginning, four minutes away from the blackout. We will not have views of the crew or communications with them during that blackout period. Um, but as the core mentioned to the crew just moments ago, we'll, we'll see them on the other side once uh, <laughs> they've re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and uh, ahead of those um, drogue deploys and then the, the main. So again, if you are in any of those states that we mentioned, Nebraska, Kansas, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, head outside right now and you might be able to see um, dragons streaking through the sky in just about five minutes from now. Pretty yeah. spectacular if you're up. Uh, it's something you don't want to miss. Now you mentioned the stickers, those were placed there uh, by previous uh, missions flown on this Dragon, which was Crew 3 and Crew 5. Uh, so that's a fun astronaut tradition that we have when they get to fly in Dragon. Uh, another tradition is naming of the capsule. So since the beginning of the US space program, astronauts have had the opportunity to name their spacecraft, starting with Alan Shepard naming his spacecraft Freedom 7 during the Mercury program. In keeping with this tradition, each of the NASA Dragon spacecraft astronauts crews have had the opportunity to uh, select uh, a name for their dragon uh, if it was the first mission for that dragon. So Endurance was first flown on NASA's Crew 3 mission, which is the capsule today. NASA astronaut Raja Chari announced the name Endurance ahead of the Crew 3 mission, which he served as commander. It has since flown on the Crew 5 mission and of course now the Crew 7 mission, totaling three flights for this spacecraft. A nice little timeline there uh, uh, for the different uh, capsules that we have. Uh, we also have Dragon Endeavor, which was the first crew capsule that we launched with crew, of course that was with uh, NASA astronauts Bob and Doug, our beloved space dads, flying in the Demonstration Mission 2 mission. That was in, gosh, I believe it was in March or May uh, of 2020. Um, it seems like it was just yesterday in, in many ways. Uh, and then we also have Dragon Resilience, uh, which supported multiple missions uh, and Dragon Endurance that we have today, as well as Dragon Freedom. So all in all, four current capsules that are active in the fleet and uh, like like you said, every time a crew flies in one, they get to put a mission patch on the inside of the capsule. Um, and they also get to sign the white room of um, the launch tower right before they ingress into the capsule uh, for their launch day. So we, we like our traditions. Yes. <laughs> Lots of traditions all around. Uh, we are about 30 seconds away from the crew beginning to um, first dip into the Earth's atmosphere and we'll really be looking to the heat shield to do a lot of that work. Um, and again, because of that plasma buildup that's going to occur, we are going to have a communications blackout with the crew um, during this time period, expecting that blackout um, to begin about a minute from now. Yeah, that uh, anticipated loss of signal or that blackout period will be about uh, six minutes long, six and a half minutes, and about a minute away, as you just said. So um, this happens every crew mission as the, as the capsule is re-entering through the Earth's atmosphere as that plasma builds up around the side of the capsule during that re-entry period as um, it's coming back through the atmosphere right in space. There is no atmosphere, uh, but when it's re-entering, it's starting to come back through the atmosphere, which ultimately builds up friction and uh, that translates into energy such as plasma forming on the exterior of the capsule but the crew stays quite comfortable uh, inside the capsule they have cooled nitrox or nitrogen oxygen uh, mixture flowing through their suits uh, and that helps keep them cool as well as the thermal systems within Dragon um, it also helps to make sure that they stay pretty comfortable even though the external temperatures can reach 3,500 degrees so um, at this point in time like 
like we said, we are entering that communications blackout period uh, right now, actually. Um, and this lasts about six and a half minutes due to the plasma formation around the spacecraft, as I said. Now, during this time, no vehicle telemetry is received by mission control or the recovery team, and no external commanding of the vehicle or voice communication is possible. But as a reminder, Dragon is designed to fly itself. During re-entry, the vehicle will be slowing down from an orbital velocity of about 17,500 miles per hour. The top temperature that Dragon will experience upon re-entry is about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And we do expect this blackout period to last for uh, another six minutes or so. Um, we are expecting to hear back from Jasmine uh, at 0941 UTC uh, or 241 a.m. Pacific time, uh, and sometimes the we actually uh, acquired that signal earlier than anticipated, so we might actually hear from her a bit sooner than that. And this is my one last plug because it does not always re-enter over the United States. If you are in those states we've mentioned several times, go now. Um, <laughs> this is literally you have like 30 seconds, so sprint outside and go and see it. Um, we are very much so looking and uh, looking forward to seeing the crew splash down and and seeing them re-enter from our side. But it's not going to be the same view certainly uh, as what you all will have. So I hope some of you are out there uh, looking up and and enjoying the view for us. Absolutely. Now we do hope to. Um, bring you views from a thermal tracking cam uh, that we hope to have once the capsule is visible. Uh, I believe the WB-57 might be on the prowl tonight. Um, and hopefully we will also be able to bring views. Uh, we have cameras located on our recovery vessel, uh, Megan, which is in place awaiting um, splashdown. It's, it's uh, a, about a mile or so away from um, from the splashdown site, and so uh, we'll also have cameras there. So as soon as we have something to bring you, we certainly will. Um, once again, the capsule is going from orbital velocity, um, about 17,000 uh, miles per hour, down to a speed of about 350 miles per hour. At that point in time, the drogue parachutes will deploy. Those are the smaller parachutes uh, that help to stabilize the capsule and help decelerate it even further. Um, down to about 119 miles per hour at that point in time, and that's roughly at about 6,500 feet above the ocean surface, the main parachutes will deploy. Um, and once again, we will hopefully bring you views once we have those. Uh, and then of course, once those main parachutes deploy, it's just a, a few seconds, <laughs> excuse me, it's actually more than a few seconds because it's uh, you know sev uh, several thousand feet off the ocean floor. Uh, ocean surface, excuse me. Uh, but ultimately, those main parachutes will help to decelerate the capsule down to about 15, 16 miles per hour uh, when it ultimately splashes down. And we are expecting that splashdown time to occur at 5.47 a.m. Eastern time, 2.47 a.m. Pacific time. Yep, now less than 10 minutes. And then once splashdown occurs, we'll continue to walk you through all of the recovery operations and step through those together um, and explain what you're seeing on your screen. But it really is a testament to all the hard work and the folks that um, are, are pulled together to do these recovery operations. As you said, the boat was staged uh, earlier this evening and everything is set up and ready for Crew 7 to splash down uh, nine minutes and 30 seconds from now. Uh, we expect that acquisition of signal, that blackout period uh, to end in a about four minutes or less from now. Again, as you mentioned, we might begin to hear the core start to call out um, to the crew to see if they've regained communications with them yet. Uh, sometimes it happens a little earlier than we expect, sometimes a little bit later. All of that is normal. It just is dependent upon when we regain communications with the crew. Um, so again, we're expecting that uh, acquisition of si signal in about three minutes and 30 seconds. And it looks like we are getting our very first view of Dragon there on your screen. Um, it is streaking through the sky as it continues to re-enter the atmosphere. Again, those parachutes have not quite deployed just yet, um, but once they are through the atmosphere, uh, successfully we'll first see the drogue chutes deploy. We're targeting 2.43 a.m. Pacific for that. And uh, just seconds later at 2.44 uh, a.m., we'll see the main chutes deploy. And of course, splash down at 2.47 a.m. Pacific off the uh, coast of Pensacola.
Yeah, this view is uh, a thermal view, uh, tracking cam from NASA's WB-57 plane. Uh, I always love seeing this come through because it, I, the, just the brightness gives you a, a good idea of, uh, and it will start to get dimmer and dimmer uh, as we get closer to the Drogue parachute deployment. Uh, this looks like it is a live view coming from Megan, which is the recovery vessel uh, positioned a safe distance away from the anticipated splashdown site. I believe this is the tracking cam, not thermal, uh, more, um, uh, I'm not sure the right way to describe it, but it's a, it's a, a live view camera, but adjusted for the darkness uh, of, the, of the night sky. So that's why the, the pixels on the camera might look a, a, a little wonky there. And even from this view, it's it's just spectacular. S so amazing to see. Uh, we are expecting the acquisition of signal to uh, be about two minutes from now and splash down. Again, we're less than 10 minutes away from that. Uh, seven minutes uh, or so away from splash down of Crew 7 to wrap up their six month uh, science and research mission to the International Space Station. Dragon SpaceX, com check. SpaceX, Dragon, we have you loud and clear. All right, so that was the voice. We have you the same. Expect automated shoot deployment. That was the voice of Commander Jasmine Mugbelly. Great to hear her voice on the other side of the comms blackout. And a great view here that thermal cam showing us live reentry of the Crew-7 team on board uh, Dragon Endurance. And the Corps also did let uh, Jasmine Mugbelly and the Crew-7 crew know that they expect a, a nominal or normal drogue shoot deploy, um, expecting us to maybe begin to get some views of that here in about a minute and a half or, or two minutes from now. And then following that will be the main uh, shoots that deploy. Continuing to get some really incredible views of Crew-7. Dragon SpaceX GPS has converged. Expect nominal altitude for drogue shoot deploy. All right, good news there. That's an indicator that we can expect the drogue parachutes to release about the 350 uh, mile per hour speed or about 18,000 feet above the ocean. As I mentioned, the, the streak becomes uh, dimmer just prior to the chute deployment. This view here is coming to us from our recovery vessel, Megan, <clears throat> which is the, the large uh, vessel that will make its way uh, out to the capsule and ultimately uh, pick it up out of the ocean and place it in the nest on board. Now we should see the Dragon drogues SpaceX pop out brace here. For drogue window. The thermal cam will provide us a much better view of the parachute deployment. So we are standing by for those drogues to deploy. We should see that begin to happen here any second from now. Tracking to about 15 seconds until drogue deploy. Once again, Dragon is reading uh, its altitude as well as uh, barometric pressure to determine when the appropriate, and there we can see the drogues deploying now, uh, the appropriate time to deploy those drogue parachutes. And so these drogue parachutes do help to stabilize and decelerate the vehicle ahead of the mains um, being deployed a short time after. Expecting mains at about 30. Rate nominal. All right, that's great news there, indicating that the rate of deceleration with the drogue shoots is as expected. 
the main parachutes will deploy next. That will occur around the 6,500 foot uh, mark above the ocean surface. And at that point in time, the capsule will be traveling around uh, 120 miles per hour. And we can see those main parachutes deploying now. Those drogue parachutes will um, land in the ocean and hopefully we will be able to recover them, but they kind of sink quickly sometimes. So uh, the recovery teams will go out and try to recover those drogue parachutes for reuse on future cargo missions. And we can see here. Main chute descent rate nominal. Great news there indicating that the deceleration rate of the... Copy 1000. So at this point in time, Jasmine is now transitioning into calling out uh, Dragon's altitude. Beautiful thermal view there of the capsule and four healthy mains. It's hard to tell on this view because again, it is thermal, <laughs> but the, the parachutes are orange and white. Uh, if you've seen a, a daytime launch, um, you'll know what they look like, and we should be able to see, hopefully... 800 meters. Dragon is now 800 meters. Copy, 800. Above the ocean. Now, once Dragon splashes down, uh, the capsule will automatically cut the ties to the parachutes. This helps uh, in the case where it might be windy. It isn't today. Uh, wind speeds are um, pretty pretty low at the moment. But if it were a little windy, um, it would help to ensure that Copy six. that Dragon doesn't get destabilized by having the, the main parachutes. And we will also recover those main parachutes from um, as they float in the ocean as well. And standing by for that splashdown, uh, now about a minute away from that or less. 400 meters. 400 meters is, is what Jasmine just called out. So the next call out we're, we'll hear is for 200 meters, and then of course splashdown. So continuing to get great views of four healthy mains, as well as the Crew Dragon with uh, four astronauts on board. Bracing at 200. And the crew is bracing for splashdown. We do hear that the fast Space boats. Copy is 200 and braced. The fast boats are en route. Standing by for splashdown. What a beautiful sight. As you can see on your screen, we have Dragon Splashdown. Space has copies, see the same. Visual and audio confirmation for Splashdown of Dragon Endurance. It has now returned home, and NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, along with ESA astronaut Andy Mogensen, JAXA astronaut Satoshi Fuokawa, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov are back on Earth after an approximately 18 and a half hour return journey from space. The SpaceX recovery ship and team has been waiting for Dragon Splashdown, and they are now making their way to that Splashdown site. Yeah, it's so exciting to see Crew 7 back on Earth after 199 days in space. They splashed down at 5.47 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time, and the teams have been ready and waiting about three mod nautical miles away in preparation for splashdown. So Dragon SpaceX, on behalf of all of SpaceX, welcome home. We're with you in 4.800. SpaceX is in our desk and thanks for the ride up and more importantly, a safe ride down. And thank you to NASA. To be back on planet.
And we did hear some and words from NASA astronaut Jasmine Monbelli. We didn't quite catch them all, uh, but of course the sentiment was her thanks for the uh, folks that have helped supported their mission um, and ensure that they got uh, back home safely on Earth. You can see that the uh, sea is really quite smooth. It doesn't look like it's too choppy at all. And we also did hear the uh, confirmation that the uh, drogue uh, parachutes were successfully cut as expected. That um, is something that happens in the recovery process here. What we're looking at right now is a thermal image. Uh, and once we are able, excuse me, let me rephrase that. Once the recovery vessel is closer. I mean, it's stable one. Copy, stable one. So that was just Jasmine reporting on Dragon's position for splashdown. Uh, this orientation is known as stable one, as we've seen in all of our uh, uh, Dragon splashdowns. Um, but once uh, Megan gets closer, uh, recovery vessel Megan gets closer to the capsule, uh, we'll be able to have um, not thermal, but just regular views because uh, those uh, vessels that are on its way, the fast boats, as well as Megan have lights and uh, bright lights at that. And so we'll be able to see uh, better views of Dragon once the recovery vessel gets a little bit closer. Uh, but that takes um, several minutes to complete as the capsule, uh, excuse me, as the recovery team has been waiting uh, three nautical miles away from the uh, the splashdown site. So it'll take a few minutes for, <laughs> for Megan to, to chug along over uh, to, to recover the Crew 7 team. And we did see a lot of social media hits of uh, folks in the Midwest as they watched Crew 7 re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. But we actually have someone on the phone who had a bird's eye view on the recovery vessel, Megan. We have uh, NASA's Rebecca Turkington, a NASA public affairs officer at the Johnson Space Center who was on the boat during the re-entry and splashed down. So again, she had a great first-hand view of the crew returning and splashing down. So Rebecca, how can you hear us. Dragon SpaceX, SpaceX is go for clear. recovery personnel to approach. Expect personnel alongside in one minute. That's great to hear, Rebecca, and we are hearing some uh, communications to the crew. Expect recovery personnel in one minute. That we do expect the recovery personnel and at to time, begin we'll to approach. Mission to come on board via the display camera view only. So okay, while we work through on. that... Hey, Sandra, how do you hear me? And I'm driving more good to the come on board. Sandra, how do you hear me? And Rebecca, we're going to come back to you in just a minute as we work through these dynamic operations for recovery. Stand by and we'll be back with you in just a minute. And so we did hear those communications um, to Crew 7, letting them know that the uh, recovery teams would begin to approach here momentarily. So we might be able to get some views on our screens as we see those uh, fast boats begin to approach the uh, Dragon capsule. Exactly. So there's excuse me, a couple of fast boats that are dedicated to re retrieving the parachutes out of the water, um, as well as a fast boat that will be dedicated to approaching the capsule and uh, basically using uh, personal protective equipment to uh, for the folks that are on the boat, because at this point in time, Dragon has just come back from space. It's possible that there are some residual, res excuse me, residual hypergolic um, fumes around the Draco thrusters and around the nose cone. So the team is actually going to approach with a hypergol yeah, sniffer. SpaceX, just for awareness, we are on board with the display camera at this time. Okay, copy on board with the display camera. And that was just uh, SpaceX core letting the Crew 7 team know that there it is, that that view uh, is uh, online once again. Uh, this allows us to see over their shoulders and once again see what they're looking at on their screens. At this point in time, it should be pretty stagnant in terms of um, none of the Draco thrusters are going to be firing anymore. They're already back in the water, so there's no trajectory to look at. Um, and there we can see on the right-hand side of your screen one of those fast boats approaching the uh, uh, Dragon Endurance capsule. And uh, as I was saying, there, there could be residual hypergolic 
um, fumes or uh, leftover around the Draco thrusters or around the nose cone. So that team is actually approaching with PPE or personal protective equipment, uh, such as respirators and uh, masks to approach closely uh, Dragon Endurance, uh, but they will actually use a hypergall sniffer to detect whether or not there are any of those fumes lingering. Um, this takes a couple minutes to complete, and once they basically check and get, um, you know, green light in terms of no residuals, uh, no fumes lingering, uh, they will give the green light for the rest of the recovery team to approach the capsule and begin uh, the rigging of the capsule for uh, onboarding it onto uh, the recovery vessel. But I, I think the communications have so, slowed down for a minute, so I'd love to hear uh, what it was like on the, on the boat. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to Rebecca Turkington, NASA Public Affairs Officer, who was on the boat during Crew 7 re-entry and splashdown. Um, and let's see if we do have a good comms check with her at this point. Rebecca, can you hear us? Yes, I can. How do you read me? We've got you loud and clear. Thank you so much for your patience there as we work through some of those communications back and forth with the crew. Um, so I would love to know, Rebecca, how was the view from the recovery vessel? What was it like? Tell us everything. Well, I think a lot of us on board the ship have a new core memory after seeing Dragon flash down this morning. We were about one and a half nautical miles away from the landing zone had a great view from the front of the ship. We saw the spacecraft appear across the horizon, a gorgeous reflection on the ocean, heard a really nice sonic boom, and we tracked Dragon all the way down to Splashdown. And it's just, it's great to see Crew 7 back home, and wow, just what a way to start the morning. I love to hear that. I can tell from the excitement in your voice that it was pretty spectacular. So I'm so happy you were able to witness this. Um, so the next question we have for you is about the weather. We've been tracking the weather throughout this journey. Um, teams, of course, gave the go for landing off of Pensacola here today. So how have the landing conditions been from your perspective? Well, Sandra, Crew 7 may have missed out on fall and winter back here on Earth while they were on board the International Space Station, but they're going to get a little taste of it this morning. It's in the low 40s out here, but winds are very light, coming in about two miles per hour, and we have just about one foot of wave height. You can really barely feel it on the ship right now. Wow. So uh, conditions are about as ideal as they can be when it comes to those winded waves, but it will definitely be a very refreshing first breath for the crew that they take back here on Earth. Absolutely. That sea really looks glass-like almost. Uh, so just a couple more questions for you. Can you describe the journey of the recovery forces to get to this point and what that entailed? Yeah, absolutely. So our original journey started almost close to a week ago in Florida with so many teams coming in to make preparations for the crew's return. After Pensacola was selected as our splashdown site, the recovery team and the vessels were relocated here. And for splashdown this morning, it was an early start. We took a series of helicopters out to the recovery vessel starting at about four and a half hours before splashdown. The medical team and recovery director were on that first flight, Direct and then SpaceX. the rest of us followed after Hyper that. sweeps and unfired, unfired ordinance checks are nominal. Rigging is now in progress. That's great to hear, Rebecca, two, and we are hearing that lift. the hypergolf... Stand by for PMC with the SpaceX flight surgeon. Again, we are hearing that the hypergall checks uh, were nominal. They did not detect any of that. So our very last question for you, Rebecca, before we continue to talk through the recovery process is what's next to retrieve the crew? Yes, I'm sure you'll walk everyone through how Dragon's going to be hoisted onto the recovery vessel. After the crew has egressed the vehicle on the ship, they will head over to the med bay where they'll get checked out by our medical team and they'll also start to take off those white uh, dynamic spacesuits. And after their medical check, they will board a helicopter and head to the airport where a plane is waiting to take them back to Houston to begin their post-flight period. I also wanted to mention that the crew is not the only ones on board Dragon. We also have really important cargo and science from experiments that are going to deliver benefits for people back here on Earth 
So the cargo team will also start working this morning through the rest of the day to inventory and process those high-priority cargo items. Some teams are going to come in here to Florida to uh, pick those up, and then others we are going to ship out to various national centers. So it's just been such a beautiful splashdown this morning, and uh, so happy and proud to be here. And with that, I'll turn things back over to you at Hawthorne. Well, there you had it, a firsthand experience of what it was like to witness Crew 7 uh, splash down off of Pensacola. Thank you so much for your time, Rebecca. Uh, that was Rebecca Turkington, NASA Public Affairs Officer at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. All right, so as you can see there on your screen, that's a live view on the left-hand side, inside Dragon Endurance. On the right-hand side is thermal cam tracking the recovery operations. Dragon SpaceX comm check on Dragon to Ground Public. We've got you loud and clear. All right, have you the same. I'll be back on board with the updates as we get closer to capsule lift. Okay, we got you, thanks. So while the Crew 7 uh, uh, crew members were doing their uh, private conference with the flight surgeon post splashdown, just an initial check to make sure that everybody's feeling okay, doing good. Uh, we took those comms out. And so that was just a, a check to make sure that we got the, the comms back on the public feed. Um, this is actually here, our first live view of a normal camera of recovery Dragon operations. SpaceX, be advised, we're going to be transitioning the forward link. Comm will be unavailable for approximately five minutes. Okay, Dragon Copy Cam will be unavailable for approximately five minutes. So at this point in time, the recovery team uh, is, is kind of split in half. Half of them are located on the recovery vessel Megan, which is the location from which we were receiving that camera view that we just had previously. This one is obviously coming from inside uh, the Dragon capsule. Um, but the other half of the recovery teams are in those fast boats. They've been tasked with retrieving the parachutes from the water, as well as performing the safety checks uh, post splashdown. Once once again, those were um, basically performing checks to make sure there weren't any hypergolic or pyrotechnic uh, residuals, um, which, when it, you know, obviously pyrotechnic could be dangerous <laughs> for explosive reasons, but hypergolics are um, in in incredibly poisonous uh, if you breathe them. So um, we weren't able to see it super clearly on the screen. However, uh, the, the crew out there had personal protective equipment to ensure that they were breathing, um, you know, clean air while they were performing those checks. Uh, those sweeps we heard were nominal, so that was the green light for uh, the other portion of the uh, fast boat crew to approach. And there is actually a, a SpaceX recovery team member uh, crawling around the capsule at this moment in time. Hopefully we can get that view back uh, momentarily. It looked like there there might have been something in the way of the camera previously, but when we have that that view back, we'll we'll bring it to you. But there there's an individual responsible for basically um, securing the harnesses around the capsule itself. Uh, those will be used to lift the capsule out of the water and onto the recovery vessel. But of course, those straps have to be put in place by hand. So there's somebody uh, actually you can. Um, oh, I, I think that was actually Jasmine's uh, hand that we saw in the shadow. I thought maybe it might, we might be able to see the, <laughs> the shadow of the individual crawling around the capsule um, through the window. But yeah, there's somebody actually crawling around uh, to, to place those harnesses uh, in the correct position and secure them. Uh, there's a number of harnesses that are required as the, as the vehicle itself is, is quite heavy. Um, and once th those are all in place, we will lift the, um, the, the vehicle uh, up into the recovery vessel using hydraulic lifts. Um, and that will basically put the capsule onto, uh, onto the vessel in a nest, which is uh, movable. Uh, we basically... <laughs> plop the capsule into the nest on the aft end of the vessel and then we translate or we we pull that nest forward so that the side hatch is at the unloading platform uh, which of course is where 
uh, we will see the, the crew egress from the capsule. Now we can actually see that side hatch where they're about to egress from there uh, at the bottom center of your screen. It's uh, the, the item there that is in a black outline. Pardon me. Um, that side hatch is the same hatch that they used to ingress. Um, how many days did you say? 199 days? <laughs> yes, they were in space for 199 days. Uh, of those, 197 were on board Space Station, of course, to include the transit to and from Space Station. Gotcha. So all that time, that side hatch has remained closed uh, as the crew was utilizing the forward hatch to uh, ingress and egress the Space Station, of course, because that's where the uh, docking adapter adapter is located, so that's the point in which Dragon has to dock with the space station. So yeah, that side hatch that we can kind of see there, uh, it will open for the first time uh, in, in hundreds of days, uh, and it will be Crew 7's first breath of fresh air uh, since they lifted off. Um, that side hatch, of course, um, goes through multiple checks while it's still on the ground, um, and it obviously is not <laughs> intended uh, for use while it is uh, while the while the vehicle is on station. Yeah, absolutely right. And if you're just joining us, it's been a busy but uh, very exciting early morning uh, for us here in Hawthorne. Uh, Crew 7 splashed down off of the coast of Pensacola, Florida at 2.47 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, the crew is still in the capsule awaiting um, to be fully rec recovered while the team uh, works through that. They'll eventually, as you were discussing, Kate, be moved onto the boat and be able to um, get out of the hatch that is directly in front of them. Um, but just some quick uh, facts about the Crew-7 mission. Uh, as we said, they spent 199 days in space total. Of those, 197 were spent on the International Space Station. They completed 3,184 orbits of the Earth and traveled more than 84,434,000 statute miles around the Earth, which is just a massive number when you think about it. Uh, Andy Mogensen has logged 199 days in space over his increments. Uh, of course, he was a part of Expedition 69 and 70 um, and will have totaled 209 days in space, uh, <laughs> including time from his previous space flight. This is NASA astronaut and commander of Crew-7, uh, Jasmine Mogbelli's first space flight. So, of course, she's logged 199 days in space. Satoshi Furukawa of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency has the most time in space of this crew. Uh, he has logged a total of 366 days in space over two flights. And Konstantin Borisov of Roscosmos uh, has spent 199 days in space as well. This was his very first space flight. Um, just a couple more fun facts for you all. Uh, the crew saw the arrival of seven visiting vehicles, which included two SpaceX cargo dragons. Uh, that was SpaceX 28 and SpaceX 29. Dragon SpaceX, comp check. Dragon, is he loud and clear? How many? Loud and clear. Forward link transition is complete. Copy. And so we did hear that call out uh, a few minutes ago that there would be about a five minute um, comms outage while they work to get uh, communications configured. All of that uh, is now uh, configured properly. So we might hear some more communications back and forth uh, with the crew ahead of their recovery and uh, placement on the recovery vessel. Um, but just to continue those uh, fun facts for you all, uh, so the crew did see seven uh, visiting vehicles arrive. They saw seven visiting vehicles depart and there was one spacewalk that took place during the crew 7 mission and that included nasa astronaut jasmine mogbelli um, for a six hour and 42 minute spacewalk the very first in her career wow what an incredible stay on station <laughs> and the hundreds of science experiments that they also contributed to as well. So they were certainly busy during this increment. I bet uh, they're probably looking forward to a nap or two uh, once they are back on, uh, on firm ground and have, done, have gone through their um, end of mission proceedings.
Yep, absolutely. And once they are um, successfully on the recovery boat, they will take that helicopter uh, back to Florida since so they splash down off the coast of Pensacola, and then they'll ride um, in a uh, plane back to Houston and um, complete some additional medical checks, some rehabilitation, um, and then uh, for both Satoshi and uh, Constantine, they'll fly back, and Andy as well, uh, they'll fly back to their respective countries. This was the very first uh, mission, actually, where every single seat is occupied by a member from a different uh, space agency. So that's exciting to see as well. Very cool. Now, on the note of um, <clears throat> recovery after you know, performing a long duration space flight. Uh, we will be assisting the crew members uh, outside as they egress through the side hatch. Uh, this is standard procedure uh, for NASA crew missions, um, you know, because they have been up there for an extensive amount of time. And of course, the body changes while you're in micro. Dragon SpaceX rigging is complete, approximately five minutes until capsule lift. All right, so that's great news there. Uh, so, you have about five minutes to look. so you can see the, the recovery platform there in the foreground uh, of this particular view. Uh, that is exactly where the crew will ultimately be assisted to. Um, and then we can see the Dragon capsule in the background there uh, bobbing very gently in the uh, silky black waters there. I, I have to say, um, I've covered, uh, this is probably my sixth maybe seventh splashdown uh, webcast. And this is, to my memory, the smoothest sea I've ever seen. Some of the views that we had earlier, the water just looked like glass. Um, the waves are so calm. So um, it, it's great to, to see. Obviously, those make for easier, quicker recovery conditions. Uh, we did hear um, about a minute ago that we're five minutes out. So now four minutes out from lifting the capsule. Um, there is a hydraulic lift there at the back end of the capsule. Oh, there's a great view of it there with our recovery team members um, uh, positioning the, uh, the hydraulic uh, uh, lift into place. Uh, the, the team member that was on the capsule, I think they may have jumped off already. Um, uh, yeah, it looks like the, the fast boat is, is departing. So um, that's always one of my favorite, but also like terrifying moments to watch uh, is that, that SpaceX team member with, a, oh, actually, no, they're still there. So the area where they're standing is actually the bay where the main parachutes are packed. So all four parachutes are packed so tightly, they fit back there into um, that that, that bin you, you could think of. Um, so that SpaceX t recovery team member is doing the final preparations for the harnesses there on Dragon Endurance, which will be basically hooked onto by the rigging. We can see that hydraulic lift uh, now being lowered. Once everything is attached, we will see that individual that is on the capsule uh, jump off into the water uh, and of course, we don't want them to be on the capsule while it is being translated up and onto the vessel for obvious safety reasons. And Dragon will remain in the nest uh, during the crew extraction and then for the journey back into port. So we'll stand by for that uh, lifting to happen just a couple minutes from now once they get everything uh, successfully secured. And so I did just want to uh, jump into, we were talking a, a bit about the crew and how they would be helped out of the capsule. And this is a very standard procedure for NASA. Dragon SpaceX, brace for capsule lift. Dragon copy, brace for lift. And so we will see that uh, individual uh, jump off the capsule here in just a second. And then the capsule will be lifted um, onto the recovery vessel. I like to think of this as the SpaceX swan dive. <laughs> and there we can see jumped in and is now making his way over to the fast boat where his re SpaceX recovery team uh, members will pull him on board just like that. And uh, now don't blink because the, the, the lifting of the capsule takes just a matter of seconds. It's quite smooth uh, and happens rather quickly. Like you were saying, we're going to lift that up out of the water and place it in the nest. That nest will then get translated to uh, the recovery deck. And there we can see Dragon Endurance now being lifted out of the water using those hydraulic lifts. Swinging a little bit, but it will be centered using the tethers uh, and then placed into that nest once centered.
all in all, this seems like um, a pretty quick recovery. Um, let's see, if we had splashdown at 247. 57. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to call this for sure, but this definitely feels like one of the fastest recoveries I've ever been a Dragon part of. SpaceX, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Recovery personnel are now completing final checks and stand by for translation to egress platform. I can copy. So at 6.14 a.m. Eastern, uh, 3.14 a.m. Pacific, Dragon Endurance has been lifted up and out of the Gulf of Mexico and is now secure on our recovery vessel. And so next up, we will see Dragon um, appear to slide forward as it gets a little um, further in on the recovery vessel. And then uh, the team will work to open up that hatch and get the crew out. Um, again, we do expect the crew to be assisted um, in getting removed from the capsule uh, because they have been aboard the International Space Station for the past uh, six months. Even though they work out for a couple hours a day to maintain um, bone and, and muscle health, uh, the adjustment back to the 1G environment on Earth um, can be um, something that takes a little getting used to. So as a safety precaution, we always do just help any of our crew members returning from space out of the um, vessel. So again, we're um, about 30 minutes or so since we splashed down or since Crew 7 rather splashed down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. They're already on the recovery vessel and we are just awaiting the next steps in the process in order to get the crew out safe and sound. And the uh, hatch that they'll actually be exiting or egressing from is in the center of your screen there. It's kind of a uh, square shaped um, yeah, it's a, it's a square shaped hatch there and um, we'll see uh, the teams install a bit of um, hardware around the edge of the hatch once they get it open to help protect it and then we'll see the crew um, come out. But we also uh, will see the footrest get removed to give a little more space for the crew as they work through those recovery op operations as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, uh, you know, we want to ensure that astronaut safety is, you know, priority number one and removing those footrests helps with that because, like you said, uh, we will be assisting the crew uh, to egress out of the capsule and uh, removing the, the footrest is just gives the, the recovery teams a, a bit more room inside the capsule to move around along with the crew. Absolutely, and you can see a more internal view of the hatch that we were just referring to there. Um, towards, towards the lower portion of your screen, you can see the black outline around it. Um, that is, of course, the hatch that the crew will exit um, out of. That's been closed since they entered in uh, Dragon all the way back in August for their launch. For those of you that have just recently tuned in, we had an on-time splashdown of Crew 7 at 5.47 a.m. Eastern, 2.47 a.m. Pacific. And just three minutes ago, with the Dragon Endurance capsule, <coughs> excuse me, was lifted up and out of the water uh, and into the nest of the recovery vessel. Um, the recovery vessel utilized for Gulf operations is Megan, uh, and uh, one not being used today is for the Atlantic operations. Um, and the, what we see here are, um, this is a cool view because we can see it better now. I want to point it out <laughs> before we lose it, is that bay where the main parachutes are stored. Um, that is the rounded square just below the side hatch. Um, right underneath where that individual is stepping into. Um, so if you can imagine, um, that gives you a good perspective of just how tightly those main parachutes have to be packed in there uh, in order to, to stow them um, and, and obviously release them. And the drogue parachutes, for those of you that might be wondering, are, you, we don't really have quite as good of a view, but they come from uh, the, the, the bay just above um, the, the side hatch. 
And so the next major milestone that we will look ahead to see uh, is when Dragon will slide a little further back uh, in the recovery boat, like we mentioned earlier, and then we'll have the uh, hatch opening process begin um, to get underway. So again, everything continuing to go really smoothly this morning following a splashdown at 2.47 a.m. Pacific of Crew-7, completing their 199-day mission in space, 197 days aboard the International Space Station. The crew actually undocked from the International space station yesterday morning at 8 20 a.m pacific um, so like we mentioned a little less than 24 hours for their journey back to earth but everything going smoothly um, they splashed down successfully off the coast of pensacola and now the recovery team is just working through those procedures in order to um, get the hatch open and get the crew out here shortly At this point in time, as you can see, the uh, Dragon vehicle is still positioned at the aft end of the recovery vessel. Uh, once everything is in place, we will translate the nest uh, where the capsule is sitting uh, forward uh, toward the forward end of the, of the vessel, and that is where the recovery deck is located, uh, where additional SpaceX team members and NASA team members are awaiting um, the the crew seven team um, spacex team members will uh, go through the side hatch opening procedure uh, which involves an additional uh, sweep for hypergolics uh, and um, like you mentioned earlier removing the side hatch and, and placing a bit of protective covering around the edge of the side hatch this helps to protect not only the capsule um, but also uh, the team members that are going in the capsule to help the crew seven uh, uh, crew members egress through the side hatch. So it does look like they are starting to wrap up uh, this portion of Dragon being in the nest. So we should expect that translation to occur here uh, in just a couple minutes from now. They'll remove some of those uh, attachments from the vehicle before that uh, translation occurs. And so from this view, we do have a pretty good view of uh, both the nose cone being closed, which closed uh, prior to splashdown, but that is the hatch uh, that the crew used when they docked to the International Space Station as well as uh, entered the International Space, in Space Station. It's not the one that they're going to exit out of um, this morning, though. They're going to exit out of that side hatch there. You can see it in the middle of the Dragon capsule. We also have a good view of Dragon's thermal protection system also known as TPS. That is all of the white paneling around the side. Uh, of course, <laughs> after re-entry, it is a little less white than before. Uh, if you recall on launch day, it was a you know pristine white, and that is not the case anymore as the thermal protection system has done its job and quite beautifully. I love how no capsule return is identical. They, they're kind of like a fingerprint. They all look a little different. And uh, following the crew getting out of the Dragon, they will, as we mentioned, be uh, taken by helicopter back to shore and then eventually back by plane to Houston, Texas. And the Dragon vehicle will be refurbished, uh, taken uh, back uh, to the processing facility in order to be reused again. And so it does look like we are seeing that translation on your screen.
and another view here, we can continue to see that translation as it occurs. It'll get um, put right in between those two uh, gate looking areas and then the crew can begin to work hatch opening operations. We can also see a SpaceX team member uh, hosing the vehicle down. This helps to wash uh, some of the salt water off. Obviously, we want to ensure that uh, corrosion is controlled. Uh, anything that comes into contact with salt water, salt in general, uh, is quite corrosive. And so we're going to start uh, basically rinsing the capsule off to try and remove as much of that salt water as possible. And so some of the next steps that we'll see uh, will be personnel on the recovery vessel that are specialized in opening up the hatch uh, begin that process. Yeah, we can actually see they've donned their PPE once again. So they're going to perform some additional safety checks um, to ensure that there are no hypergolic uh, residuals or fumes there uh, around the side hatch. Once again, this is um, the hypergolic fumes are uh, toxic uh, if you breathe them in. So we want to ensure that none of those are remaining. And this view back inside uh, Dragon, as you can see, um, Jas NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, commander, and uh, ESA, European Space Agency astronaut Andy Mogensen. It's Jasmine's first flight, and it is Andy's second space flight. And so we also do have uh, medical doctors on board that help to take care of the crew after the hatch opening and will conduct a series of initial checks before they are flown um, off by that hel helicopter back to shore. So as the team continues to work through those hatch opening operations, um, it is important to note that uh, Jasmine Mogbelli, Andy Mogensen, Satoshi Furukawa, and Konstantin Borisov will be getting some assistance from their recovery teams while they exit the capsule. So this is the same process for any returning long duration space flight uh, for Dragon. Uh, you also see it when we have the Soyuz that lands with crew on board. They're helped out of the capsule and um, then transported via chair over to the medical recovery tent. Uh, so this is standard operating procedure for long duration space flights. So it hasn't even been an hour since Crew 7 splashed down at 2.47 a.m. Pacific, and they are already on the recovery vessel. Um, the team has secured them in the Dragon's Nest and completed that translation maneuver to get them a, a little bit closer into the prime position for hatch opening. And they are beginning to step through some of those procedures to uh, get that hatch open here shortly. Getting another view here of the hatch, you can see um, it pretty clearly in your screen. And we so can see that they've removed the access panel on the side hatch. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that side hatch access panel uh, basically protects the, the location where uh, we perform the side hatch leak check. Uh, so we will... Dragon SpaceX, stand by for side hatch opening and egress. We'll be passing you off to the recovery team and see you back in Hawthorne soon. Dragon Campies, they're here. <laughs> so yeah, that side hatch access panel um, is where we are able to untorque uh, the, as you can see in action now. And the side hatch is open for the first time in 199 days. Like we're getting some waves from Crew 7.
first face they've seen back on Earth since August. <laughs> Once again, this is their first brush of for, <laughs> first breath of fresh air. Uh, in in uh, several months, and uh, once again, the first time that the side hatch has been open. Um, the last time it was open was the day they went to space. So it looks like here, just the SpaceX team member doing initial check-in with the crew, uh, making sure that everybody is feeling okay uh, and uh, feels ready to egress from the capsule. Uh, probably letting them know that there is, you know, no return trip at this moment, <laughs> no rocket in place. I'll have to wait to be reassigned for the next <laughs> one, I guess. Um, yeah, so again, Crew 7 launched uh, back in August, August 26th of 2023. So in all, they spent 199 days in space. And so we will begin to see um, some of that uh, safety equipment installed around the hatch just for protection purposes and uh, for reuse capabilities. And then we'll even begin to see some of those uh, footrests uh, begin to be removed to just give the crew a little more space to get out. But first, the photo opportunity. Yep, absolutely. We probably couldn't see it from this view, but I have a feeling that there were some thumbs up uh, for the photo. So at this point in time, we should we should see some of those footrests begin to be removed. Not entirely sure what the uh, order will be here in terms of who will uh, egress first. Uh, it always varies from from crew to crew, but it looks like we uh, may have some footrests coming off now. Once again, this just allows the uh, folks that are assisting the crew in their egress a little bit more room to work. Fun fact, the footrests are custom sized to each astronaut um, in terms of like small, medium or large. So in order to ensure maximum safety and comfort, uh, we customize the, the footrest as well as the armrest, uh, as well as the bucket itself, uh, the, the seat bucket rather that they, that they sit in. Um, as every astronaut is is different. <laughs> um, and so to ensure that everybody is able to remain comfortable and safe, uh, those those items are are customized for their body proportions as well as the spacesuits themselves. Speaking of spacesuits, we can see that those visors are in the open and up position. So uh, once the crew was safely splashed down, they were given the okay to lift the visors. No need to keep those down and in the locked position uh, once we were outside of those dynamic events. For those of you that have just recently joined us, we had a beautiful nighttime splashdown at 5.47 a.m. Eastern or 2.47 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the Dragon Endurance vehicle is now on board our recovery vessel, uh, Megan, in the Gulf, uh, the, just off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. And we're now awaiting the egress or the exit of our four Crew 7 members. Um, and this will uh, be assisted out onto the recovery deck. And the recovery vessel is actually named after NASA astronaut Megan MacArthur. Uh, she flew on board Crew 2. That was my first space uh, launch I ever got to see in person. <laughs> so really special to get to see her launch. Uh, she also flew on board STS-125. So great to see Crew 7 uh, back on board Megan's namesake. Uh, we are expecting egress here in just a couple minutes. They are working to install um, that safety equipment around the hatch as well as remove the footrests. And so we uh, typically will either see the commander or the pilot egress or get out of their um, seats first and that's just due to the proximity of uh, their location to the hatch usually it's a little easier to get uh, one of those two out uh, ahead of the um, mission specialists on either side now you mentioned the the namesake for megan um, of course our 
The Atlantic Recovery Vessel is named after Shannon Walker, who flew on uh, the NASA Crew 1 mission. So we named these recovery vessels after our first two female astronauts to fly in uh, our Dragon capsules. So I love the, um, the tribute there that, we've, that we have paid uh, to uh, these incredible women that have um, you know, taken part in, in spaceflight here at SpaceX. So as they continue to step through those procedures, again, just a reminder, we do expect the crew to be assisted out of the vehicle um, as well as be assisted in standing up and getting um, uh, uh, rolled away uh, in order for those initial medical checks. Um, this is standard for all long duration uh, space flights. And uh, they'll jump right into their post-flight reconditioning period uh, that begins on splashdown day. And it lasts for about 45 days to help return crew members to their pre-flight condition. Um, like we've mentioned, they do exercise while on board the International Space Station for a couple hours a day. And that does help maintain some bone and, and um, muscle mass and prevent that loss. Uh, but because of the microgravity environment of the International Space Station, um, there is still a recovery period uh, that takes place. And again, that's about a 45 day period to just get them back to pre-flight condition. Now, immediately after they egress um, from the capsule, they will be transported back into, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the medical bays that are on board uh, the recovery vessel where they will be seen by uh, the flight surgeon for a preliminary uh, medical checkup immediately after egressing. It looks like we are going to have our very first views of uh, egress here. I think that may have been Andy. This is An uh, Andy's second space flight. He's from the European Space Agency. And Andy Mogensen now out of Crew 7 capsule. And you see he is getting assisted there. That is completely normal. And as expected, this will take place for all four crew members. Yeah, this is standard procedure uh, when we uh, egress the NASA astronauts from, <clears throat> from Dragon. Uh, we assist them into, um, it's not quite a wheelchair. And it's not quite a... Um, well, I can't think of the, <laughs> I can't think of the word for it. Not a gurney, um, but we roll them back into the medical bay, and this just helps ensure their safety. Um, because sometimes, even though we had uh, amazing recovery conditions tonight, it's not always the case. Sometimes we can get wave height of a couple feet, um, which could make for an unstable vessel. So, um, regardless of the the sea conditions, we always assist the crew uh, in getting out of the capsule and making their way back to the medical bay. We did see some thumbs up uh, and some cheers for Andy Mogensen as he uh, egressed the capsule. Next up is going to be the commander of Crew 7. That's NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli. This is her first space flight. What an experience it must be this first time of, of feeling gravity for really kind of the first time because if you're born into it and you don't really know what it's like to not feel it, this, I could imagine it would be quite an experience to, to feel it and really feel it for, um, you know, at this magnitude for the first time. And some waves there from uh, NASA astronaut Jasmine Mugbelli. So next up out of the capsule will be the two mission specialists, uh, Konstantin Borisov from Roscosmos, as well as Satoshi Furukawa from the Japan Exploration Agent, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency.
So if you're just joining us, Crew 7 splashed down off the coast of Florida at 2.47 a.m. Pacific. We have had two crew members already egress or exit the capsule. That was European Space Agency astronaut uh, Andy Mogensen, as well as NASA astronaut Jasmine Mugbelli. And there's two more uh, astronauts on board, and we're uh, working through those egress procedures, everything going really smoothly. Following this, the crew will fly back to shore via helicopter, and then they will fly uh, by plane back to Houston. And from there, they will um, go to their respective countries. Again, as we mentioned, this is the very first space flight where every single seat was occupied by a member of a different space agency. We are seeing on our screen there another one of the footrests as it is uh, removed, just to give the crew, um, the recovery crew rather, a little more um, space in, in order to help get the crew out. As we mentioned, two of the four have already egressed. <clears throat> Excuse me, we already have uh, Commander Jasmine Mogbelli and pilot Andreas Mogensen. They've already exited. Uh, we now have Konstantin Borisov and Satoshi Furukaka uh, still on board. Excuse me, Furuk. <laughs> It's early or late. <laughs> Furukawa. <laughs> Thank you, Furukawa. Uh, still on board uh, the Dragon capsule. And we should see one of them egress here just momentarily. And it looks like they're beginning to egress now. I believe this is Konstantin Borisov of Roscosmos, his first space flight. And Konstantin Borisov has successfully egressed. Some handshakes there, it looks like. Thumbs, Thumbs up, up and waves. happy waves. <laughs> yep. So the uh, remaining Crew 7 crew member inside uh, Dragon is JAXA, or Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa. Again, this is his uh, second space flight. And so Satoshi Furukawa actually has the most uh, time spent in space of Crew 7. He's logged a total of 366 days in space over two flights. So just, just a little over a year in space and all. <laughs> That's incredible. And it looks like he is now egressing. Once again, this is standard procedure uh, <clears throat> for assisting all the crew members uh, into the medical bays. And Satoshi Furukawa, the last member of Crew 7, now out of the vehicle. So I just did a bit of math. Um, now that we have officially egressed all four crew members, uh, we had an on-time 
splashdown at 2.47 a.m. Pacific. We lifted, we lifted the capsule uh, onto the recovery vessel at 3.14 a.m. So that was a total of 27 minutes for recovery operations. Uh, and then it was from 3.14 a.m. to uh, 3.42 a.m. when we completed egress, another uh, 28 minutes. So it basically took just as long uh, to, to uh, lift them out of the water as it did to bring them out of the capsule. <laughs> so all in all, really efficient recovery operations. So congrats to the SpaceX recovery team on such efficient operations there. Absolutely, less than an hour from splashdown to egress. So great to see that. And now that Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine are safely back home on Earth and getting checked out by the NASA medical team, we're going to wrap up our live coverage of their return. So this all kicked off on August, uh, in August of 2023 from historic launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. After a successful liftoff and separation from Falcon 9, Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine made a 29-hour flight on board Dragon to the International Space Station. And since arriving at the space station, they spent nearly six months as members of Expedition 69 and 70, executing science experiments, a spacewalk, and repairs while aboard the orbiting laboratory. Their journey home began about 19 hours ago on March 11th when they closed the hatch to Dragon and undocked from the space station at 8.20 a.m. Pacific time. After four successful departure burns and a phasing burn to line up their orbit, Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine rested for a few hours before waking up to prepare for re-entry this morning. We jettisoned Dragon trunk, jet, excuse me, we jettisoned Dragon's trunk and performed our final on-orbit maneuver, uh, the approximately 14-minute long deorbit burn at 1.56 a.m. Pacific time or 4.56 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and that ultimately is what put Dragon on its path home. The spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and slowed its descent with successful deployments of two drogue parachutes and four healthy mains with the final splashdown occurring off the coast of Pensacola, Florida at 2.47 a.m. Pacific time or 5 47 a.m. Eastern Time. Now, as you saw following that successful splashdown, we saw SpaceX recovery experts move in quickly and prepare Dragon Endurance for its lift into the recovery vessel, or onto the recovery vessel. And uh, in just a little less than an hour following splashdown, we saw Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine make their way out of Dragon and into the recovery ship's medical facilities, safe and sound. Next up, they'll catch a helicopter flight back to shore where they'll transfer to aircraft that will take them home. Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine will take a NASA plane for the short flight back to Houston, and then they'll be reunited with families to bring an end to this mission. It's been an honor and a privilege to share this journey with all of you as we continue in this new era in human spaceflight. Return today marks the end of the direct handover that we just executed after successfully launching the Crew-8 mission to the space station just a little over a week ago. <clears throat> it's been an incredible honor and joy to share this mission with the public. All of the teams from SpaceX and NASA continue to work hard to keep America leading the world in human spaceflight. Continue to follow SpaceX and NASA online and on social media for updates for the very latest on crew and cargo flights to and from the International Space Station. And we will, of course, continue to share the progress of Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine on social media as they travel back home. We also have a post-splashdown media telecon coming up at approximately 4 a.m. Pacific, 7 a.m. Eastern, where leadership from NASA, JAXA, ESA, and SpaceX will share a final update as we conclude this successful mission. So we'll say thanks one more time for tuning in and cheering on Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine as they made their return back to Earth. From all of us at NASA and SpaceX, welcome home, Crew 7. And on behalf of the many incredible females who have supported Crew 7 and contributed to the success of this mission across NASA and SpaceX, ESA and JAXA and Roscosmos, happy Women's History Month. So long. <laughs>